because we're just recording. So welcome to uh, to the third session on disclosure series uh, for software uh, crafters Madrid. Um, so in the past two sessions, seems like a long time ago now. The last one was in November. Yes. So we we went through the basics of closure, some aspects of the functional paradigm, a bit of data structures. This session, seeing that although we were, I was going to go a bit deeper into the functional paradigm, I think maybe it's been a long time. So maybe it's good to do a bit of recap. Um, first of all, show of hands uh, from the people who are attending. So you can use the hands kind of um, uh, function in Zoom to tell me if you have a closure um, environment at the very least a REPL running. So who has a closure REPL running? And if you don't know what closure REPL is, then obviously you didn't either attend <laughs> the last ones or 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 it's been a, it's been a very long time indeed. So show of hands who uh, everyone who has the closure record running at least the closure environment. And don't worry if you don't because I will show you how to to run it. Okay, so only um, okay. Elder and Joachim um, has running. Eduardo has it running as well. Um, okay. Line, line REPL, yes, it will be line REPL. I will, so let me let me show you a bunch of ways of running it, yeah? So if you have Linegal in, installed, I can show you where Linegal is on there. So if in Google, you can just do a search for L-E-I-N closure. And you should see, yeah, the Linegal as one of the, the first links, right? So I'm gonna paste that in the chat here as well. So you, you have, so you can either have the line can running or you can have closure tools running. So if you search for closure tools in on, on the web in Google, then you it will show you how to run just a second. I can actually put those there for you as well. Yeah, closure. So, so it's closure getting started, and so any one of these things will will allow you to have closures closure tools running as well. Another thing that I'm gonna, if you can't run any of those, what I'm gonna do is give you access to a website or URL for a website that has something like this already running. So let me just find that quickly. Um, Bear with me. Okay, so this is an online repo that you can execute and evaluate things in. You just need Google Chrome and you just go on to this URL and you'll have that run. Yeah. So there's a bunch of ways of, of running closure. I want you today, uh, in the past uh, two sessions, what we did was run the session on. Um, um, in the REPL. So we, we entered a few commands and we saw how things were working and so on. Today, I would like to actually use a closure file because this is the next step in us starting larger programs in closure, which I will show you in the in the next couple of series, right? So I would like you to get closure files, one closure file. So if you go on to this um, website, on the left hand, you will have a file in fact, what I can do is I can even show you what it looks like here. Yeah. So, so see, on the left hand, you have a file, and on the right hand, you have a session. Mine's kind of timed out because I had it open a while ago. So there you go. And you can do an execute and see it does have a world. And then you can say, for, for example, change that and execute that again. See, it's changed that again. So you can, so you have a file on the left hand side running, and you can do things here. So that's if you if you just want to use the online version, and that will will be more than enough. 
However, you should be able to, you should be running it on your local machine as well, because that's the best way to do it. Sorry, I think I'm not sharing my screen. So let me share my screen again. Okay. All right. So let me show you the, so this is what it looks like, the REPL. Yeah. Uh, this is the website that I gave you. It has a kind of a program on the left-hand side of your file, basically. You can execute it, and as you can see, and I made the change here. And then you can, if I execute it again, see, you can, so, so that's all you need. You need a, something to store your source uh, or your code as you're running it. In the REPL, you know, you, it's not as easy to, to manage code, so you need a file. If you, if you want to use the, your closure environment, so for example, I have line REPL here. So if you do that, by the way, if you're running line again, you can, you can create a new project. The, the easiest way to create, so for example, I've created a new project, but in order for you to create a call software on Madrid, and all you need to type is line new Socra Madrid, yeah? And if you press enter, it will create this structure for you. It will create a few more files as well, but basically, in particular, you, you should see a project or CLJ, um, and it will create a source and a test directory and a target directory for you as well. Yeah, don't worry about the other files. Um, and then if if I cap project or CLJ, it should it will have other stuff in it as well, but primarily it should have a dev project, dependencies we're using closure version 10. Um, and that's that's all all they will do, right? Now, if I do line REPL, you can you can start the REPL. Yeah. So there there you go. Your REPL has started. And what you can do is now on a different editor, you can within there you can create. You will see a file called. So if I go here and go to source and um, yeah, so crab grade. Um, so if you, so, I have a file there called code or closure, and you can when you start the REPL, it actually loads that file for you already. And I can, in fact, if I go type in, I think it's uh, yeah, there you go. So it will be like this. So you can reload that file. You type in this command. So for example, if I type this it will reload the file. So then you always have that file running. So for example, if I go into, so now I'm gonna use Vim as my editor, you can use any editor and go edit this core um, dot CLJ file, right? Anybody who has any issues with doing that, raise their hands. Do you have a file and you can run it in, in the closure repo? or you can just go to the website. So does anybody, sorry, I can't see the comments. No issues, good. So um, yeah, a Maria or Helda, let me know if anybody else has raised their hands because I'd like everyone to make sure that they have the files running. Yep, will do. Okay, perfect. All right, okay, so that means that you can run your, your Hello World closure file, yeah? And in fact, what we are gonna do now is change, edit this file. I have lots of stuff there, but what I'm gonna do is kind of get rid of that. And let's say we start with, from start from scratch again. So I showed you a bunch of things. That's why I'm gonna go a bit faster today and I have some things prepared because I don't want to type a lot of stuff, but you can you can type as I go along, um, but and I'll show you exactly exactly what these things are. So the first thing we're going to do is to recap. We did this hello world thing, right? So so the way to to create a, this is the way to create a function. So this top thing. So you you write def n say hello with two brackets, and then bracket println hello world. So I'd like you to type that in your file. Yeah. And then 
once you've typed that in your file, I'd like you to, um, don't worry about this comment. I'd like you to type this, print hello. So basically these from line nine to 12, I'd like to, I'd like you to put that in just so that I know you you have this running. So if I did do this and, and save the file and I can, if I reload the file, I could, it should say hello. As you can see here, it's saying hello because I've printed hello there. Yeah? So that means that you, you can run a closure file basically. Yeah. Now, if you are using other IDs, you while I do this, you can keep you can make the changes and reload the file and and it will show you the changes here. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, when you are programming uh, in the real world or when you are doing a, kind of getting a bit more used to closure, you don't want to have to load the files every time and so on. I personally have Vim and Fireplace running so that I can do this in a much more seamless way. What I'm going to do is send you on the practically, there is a website that tells you how to install a lot of these different development environments. Yeah. And I'm going to send you those. I'm going to send you a link. And this link is so copy this link and paste it somewhere because this link is um, is your homework. Yeah. So what I would like you to do, because it tells you how to install the closure environment for for real. Yeah. So, for example, the the version I'm using, in fact, I can show you. Um, so it will take you to this. Yeah. The version that I am using is kind of, um, it's not, I don't use space Vim. I use just normal Vim. And I use the Fireplace plugin for Vim. And that allows me to run um, closure programs using a Vim editor. You can use many different editors. You can use Emacs if that's what you like. You can use NeoVim. You can use Calva if you're into Visual Studio Code. That's actually a really good one and it's very well integrated. So if you are familiar with, with Visual Studio or Visual, um, uh, Visual Studio, uh, Studio Code, then you can use Calva. You can use um, Atom. It's also a good editor. And you can use IntelliJ and Cursi, which is really good, but you, you have to pay for it. There's, it's, it's, you can use a you know, evaluation version, but for people who are familiar to Java and IntelliJ, they can use this and it, you know, you'll be quite familiar with how things work on there. So there, there are many different ways of running closure, but the most basic one is, you know, edit a file and load the file into your REPL and that will, that will be enough for this exercise. But your homework is to install the editor of your choice and get the same file working within it. Yeah? Make sense for everyone? I'm kind of monitoring the chat as well so that if there is any issues or anyone has any issues or any questions, just put that onto the, onto the chat and I will answer it immediately. Yeah? So in my case, as you said, as you saw, I could actually run, load the file and it will run there. But in because I'm running in Fireplace, I could do this. So keep an eye at the bottom of, of this film screen. And I could do this. And as you can see, at the bottom, I get the, the same thing that I had here, right? This thing I had here, now I have here as well. Because what that does is I've evaluated this expression using my own keyboard shortcuts, and it, it runs them here, yeah? So this is a good way. It's a very quick way of executing the code that you write here. Yeah? So for example, if I said that now, uh, print ln, let's say, hello one, and I do, see, it says hello one down there, yeah? So I uh, allows me to run my, my code really, really quickly. And so once you have your own Thing installed, you'll do the same. So, but if, for example, I can say hello one here and save my file, come back to here, 
just up arrow, enter again, and you can see it says hello one. Yeah, cool. So now a bit more of a recap. If everyone is able to run their file, please raise your hand or just put something in the meeting chat if you are not able to run your file. Yeah, because I'd like people to to con to follow me along, basically. Yeah, if you can't follow me along, don't worry, I will help you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So today we are going to do a bit for recap as well. Um, as I showed you, we, we talked about functions. Functions are the basics of how Clojure runs. And you, you in Clojure, you have functions within namespaces. So for example, here, the file that I have, um, I have a, a namespace called Socra Madrid Core. And, and then I, I have a def and say hello function within the Socra Madrid Core. So you're familiar with, if you are, from C sharp world, you'll be familiar with namespaces. If you are from the Java world, it's the same as packages, but there is no concept of classes and those kind of things. What you have are basically namespaces and functions in Clojure. So they, you know, you can have the function with the same name in a different namespace, and you know that's fine. Uh, and namespaces are the primary way of organizing your Clojure code. Yeah, as you can see. In the way the, uh, the project is structured, uh, is structured um, in the same way. So I've got source uh, Socra, uh, Socra Madrid, and under there, there's a core, core closure. Yeah. And if I see here, it's the namespace follows the same thing. It's Socra Madrid dot core. So source is implied. And then I have a Socra Madrid, that's basically the file that it lives in, uh, sorry, the directory that it lives in, and then core is the file, so core.closure. So, so the namespace matches the directory structure and file structure of your code, yeah? This is how, how it works. So a fun functions are defined within there, and a function, the way it's defined is using the def and keyword, yeah? So that's what I went through in the first, first part of the 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 series as well and then anything outside the function is executed directly that's why when i load this file this line 12 gets executed directly and it's and it's output on on there right because it's a it's a direct call to the function that i i described yeah so that's how functions work in in closure yeah you can have anonymous functions as well and they are defined using the FN keyword. So for example, I could define exactly this one using def, which is basically associates anything that you define to a symbol, which is, so I can say def say hello who, yeah? And I can define a function here. And this is an anonymous function that I'm defining with the FN keyword, yeah? And I'm saying the same thing here. Thing, hello world again. So this is a function that I have defined, right? So I can now evaluate this and then say here, I can now call this function and call it, call it say hello to. As I said, the way you call a function is you basically put it into in brackets. The first First thing in the in the brackets is the function name and anything that follows our arguments to that function, right? So I can save that, load it if you don't have any ID running, and you can see it says hello world again. So it's defined the function, hello world two, and I'm calling that function, and that is actually doing a println and that says hello world again. Yeah. So this is kind of again, just to recap the basics of functions, right? Um, now, what I'm going to do is show you like some data structures as I showed you before as well. You know, you've got in Clojure, you've got lists. Um, you can say, for example, uh, def x. So again, describing a variable almost, it's like a variable, but it's more like a constant than a variable, yeah? But it can be defined again, yeah? So def and a list, everything is a list in Clojure. So if so, here I am escaping it with this character, 
Yeah. And I can say a did list of one, two, three, four, and this is a list here. Yeah? Again, you can load it and see it will it will print. Uh, it won't print this. It will define the list. Yeah. In my case, I'm just gonna evaluate it, and then I'm gonna say, well, okay, print ln x, and if I do that, and then that, see, it's printed one, two, three, four. Similarly, you can. If I save this file and load it again, it should do the same to me. Yeah? One, two, three, four, right? So this is a list basically. So I'm going to stop loading the files now because now you get the point. If I'm running it, you can reload to run it. Yeah. Everyone okay for now? Good. Assuming everyone's good, just going to have a quick look at the chat. Yeah, seems to be no questions. Either I've lost everyone or everyone's doing well. <laughs> All right. So similarly, you've got um, you can have vectors in closure. So lists are um, they are linked lists, and you can again go back to the previous session and go through it, and it will I'll, it will show you what I'm, you know the more details around the list, and you can have vectors. Uh, vectors you don't have to escape because they start like this. Vectors are indexed, right? So the linked list is the most efficient data structure in terms of memory uses and so on. But these are almost associated lists where each element has an index. So you can kind of use it for random access and find what is at X element and that kind of stuff and it will, it will give you, right? So, so that's a vector, right? Similarly, you have sets. As I showed you previously, the way that you you create a set is um, like this, and you would have a hash, and it uses curly brackets for sets, yeah, like that. So this is a set, yeah. So as you can see, when I print it out, you can see that the set is is unordered order is not guaranteed but if i define the set to be i don't know one two three four and four what it should do is um sorry let me give you the key yeah so it won't see it's saying that it's a syntax error i'm adding two duplicates into a set right so sets are not meant to have duplicates and in fact if you do that in calculations, it will just remove it, right? So in what I can show you is now a union of a set. So I'm kind of bringing in this namespace that's not brought in by default. So this is like an import statement, a require. If you're using the um, a closure, like a repo, you can also do a require here as well, like this. So, down here, you can see I'm doing a require uh, closure dot set as s, and it's the same thing, right? So basically, it's binding s to that namespace. So now I can call things like s union of a nothing and of let's say one and two. So two sets, union of two sets will give me a set of one and two. But if I union, uh, let's say three, uh, so two and three, and union that with one and two, I should get a set that has the elements one, two, and three, not necessarily in that order. Yeah, because order is not guaranteed in set. Yeah, so now I have one, three, and two, that's a union. Yeah, so this is something I didn't show last time. So in terms of how you can do unions of sets and so on, but now now you have that. Yeah. Okay. Going well, everyone. <laughs> no you follow in the chat, so yep. <laughs> everyone following along. So please, please run this as I'm going along. I'm doing it kind of nice and slow so that you you understand it. 
uh, and that you can run along with it because the idea is to start building some confidence for you to now start running your own closure programs yeah so i'm not i'm still recapping a lot of the stuff that we went through unions are new but again you can you know do closure doc searches and you can see what's what you can do with a set what you can do with a vector and what you can do with a closure list and the other thing that is worth definitely worth mentioning are closure maps yeah so again these are all can be these all these structures can be nested you can have lists within lists you can have vectors within vectors you can have you know sets within you know a set could be a, one element within a list of things so they can be arbitrarily nested to provide you with a full data structure so think json basically yeah then you can have maps so i can say mx the way maps are described is key value and i showed you this colon is is, a, is effectively it's a keyword and so i can say name is match and surname yeah so this mx is a map okay so now in order to i can say print uh print ln and you can call, almost use the key as the function name so i can say what is my surname from this data structure of MX here. Yeah? So I can do it like this. Um, unable to resolve on this because I didn't resolve all like this. Now I feel that there. Yeah? So you can see it says but now. Yeah. Okay. And if I again if I load it, I should have the same. All good. So those are the kind of basic data structures of closure. Okay, now that you we have uh, okay, so now that we are um, looking at look, we've seen all the data structures, I would also show you what the what I show you in terms of what the functional paradigm actually is and what it means. Again, there was a this you can go back into the previous recordings to see to get more details on this, but. As I showed you last time, the functional paradigm is a programming paradigm where programs are constructed by applying and composing functions. It is declarative paradigm in which function definitions are trees of expressions that map values to other values, rather than a sequence of imperative statements that update the program's running state. Yeah. So the way that I showed you this is that in a in an imperative language say let's say that i had this you know this y and i wanted you to say well okay give get me another list that is has each element in there incrementally in an imperative language you will go through a for loop you will create a new new thing a new list which will be empty in the first instance and then you would loop through the the y and you start constructing the new one by incrementing whatever you find in 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 the first instance but in a functional paradigm you don't do that you you just map over it yeah so for example in in the functional paradigm what i would do is i would say map and onto so let me just show what the syntax for that is so function and collection okay so i would say map increment is a function so that's a higher order function i'm just uh, increment is a def function already defined in the language yeah so i'm just using it as the like as a function name here so i'm saying apply or map increment function onto y yeah so if i evaluate that why unable to resolve why in this context so let's describe why and then as you can see i map that now rather than one two three four which is what y is i am mapping the increment function over y and i'm getting a another new list of two three four and five incremented yeah this is the essence of functional program right you have immutable data structures you're taking functions and you you're applying it onto data yeah 
and you can have nested functions which functions applied over functions functions applied over data and and so it goes right so this is what the functional paradigm means you know you it's a declarative thing everything is returning something else you're not changing state or mutating state yeah okay any questions so far no all right good so moving forward let's see what else we may want to recap on um i gave you a few exercises again on 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 this and kind of bringing this home uh in the past two uh, sessions so go back there if you are uh unfamiliar and that will help you understand but the repetition is the way you learn so I am repeating a few of those things just so that you can you can start learning and 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 seeing that in a better way. Okay, so now I'll show you a few other things. First of all, I would like to kind of introduce a few more of the of the functional paradigms. Yeah. Now, one thing that I showed you last time is basically the fizz buzz. So again, if you are unfamiliar with this, go back to um, go back to the oops, the previous sessions and have a look at the Fizzbuzz Kata that we did. So the the idea for the Fizzbuzz Kata is that you you basically and this you you may have this. If you don't have this, I'm going to give you a bit of time to to start typing this as well, right? While I'm doing this, you can type it, um, as you can see. Yeah. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this onto chat so that you can copy it. Yeah. And so you can copy it, put it in your file. And run it. So it seems like I can't hmm. paste it into your file anyway. So so I have a look in this because I'm trying to put and paste into Zoom, but I seem to have lost the ability to do so. Um, yeah, anyway, so, um, yeah, so basically, rather, you've got the first, the, the large function already in chat, then, so that's the pop function, which actually has the logic for the face bus, and then you can, basically, what I'm doing here is, for each one of the elements that we, I provide, I map the face bus function onto those elements, and then in here, what I'm doing is, um, so there is this comment, by the way, this comment thing means that you, it doesn't get executed. Anything within comments doesn't get executed yet. Um, so now, so if I evaluate these things, again, you can load and run it, but I'm just evaluating it. As you can see down here, when I say fizz buzz one, two, three, four, five, six to 15, um, it is saying, one, two, phase, four, buzz, instead of five, it's a phase, and for, for 15, oh, sorry, six is phase, and for 15, it's a phase buzz, yeah? So you, again, look at the phase buzz kata documentation to see what the logic is and why this is being uh, done in the way it is, yeah? Now, I can show you some things around partials and closures. So closure, not as in closure with a J, but with a closure with an S, right? So in functional programming, uh, functions can close over data. So that's what a closure is, yeah? So for example, let me show you some, an example of a closure. So I can say something like, 
So this is the function I'm saying add X and I'm creating an anonymous function within it that will that actually takes the, the value of X and applies it to N that is basically when I will call the second function, yeah? So this function, what this function does, and again, this is in functional language, if you're not familiar with it, it's gonna make you a bit um, confused because this function is not doing anything other than defining a new function. And that new function actually closes over the parameter supplied to the creator's function, yeah? So uh, in object-oriented languages, you, you kind of have certain patterns that allow you to do certain things like that. But effectively, what you do in there is you create an instantiate an object with the from what is passed through the constructor, right? And then that object can can do things while it's maintaining state within within it uh, in terms of how it was created. So it's a sim same thing that's happening here, but this is what is a what, what is known as a closure. Closure as in CLO as you are in. Yeah. If you are unfamiliar with 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 what closures are, you can again Google that and do a bit more research on closures. But effectively what it's doing is it's creating this function, a new function that closes over the the data or the or has a visibility of something that was supplied or, or to it in its context, right? The function that created it. So in this case, so for example, I can now say, um, create a new function, def n add, let's say five, yeah? And, and Actually, this new function is gonna be a function of um, like this, add x five, yeah? So this new function, in fact, I can even call it like this, def add five is add x five. So let's see if this works. Add x in this context here, yeah. okay. So now I can say add five, yeah? Add five as a function and add it, add 10 to it. And you can see it's, it's giving me 15. So, but add five is a function that has been created by supplying five to add X, which was the function here. So basically what, what this is an example of a closure is, is state, maybe it's better to look at it like this. It stays from its context being used inside another function that then can live on its own right. So they're like objects basically in an object oriented language. And these are known in the functional paradigm as closures. You are closing over, over a state basically, yeah? So that's one thing. The other thing is, is uh, in, in functional paradigm is something called currying, right? Closure doesn't have currying. What it does have is partial functions, right? So currying is, I'll, I'll tell you more about currying later, but partial functions are functions that are partially applied. So they're not fully done yet, yeah? So you can, again, they are similar to closures. Uh, you can use them in similar ways. So for example, there is a plus function in closure. So you can say plus one, one, yeah? And that will give you two, right? Or you can say plus five, one, and that will give you um, six, right? Now, actually I can call this the new add five but create a new partial function, yeah? So I can say def new add five, create a new function, and I can say partial plus and five. 
So what I'm doing is I'm creating a partial function made up of plus, and I'm giving it already the first argument, just like I did in my closure here. Yeah. So now with my this one, I can now say things like new add five. And so I, so this function is my new add five. It will do the same thing. Oops. Add new add five. Oh, sorry. Five. Yeah. So it's six. So I can give it three and again. Eight, yeah. So this is a partial function. I've called it, created a new a function called new add five, partially applied it to the plus function. So from the plus function, partially applying one of his arguments, I've created a new, new function. And the and that new function can then be used as if it was a normal function, but taking one less argument. Yeah. So these are partial functions. Again, in the functional paradigm partial functions are, you will see them a lot, yeah? But in fact, more so than partial functions, you will see cutting, yeah? In closure, there is no cutting. But cutting works in a very similar way um, as partial functions. And in most languages like Pascal and so on, you will see cutting. In cutting, what normally happens is you just remove the word partial is implicitly applied. So what currying does is that as soon as it sees a function that is only has some of the arguments, not all the arguments, incomplete argument list, it automatically decides that that is a partial function. So rather than applying that function, it will give you a new function that's partially applied. That's currying. So currying is auto automatic partial function um, feature, right? Closure doesn't have it. In closure, you always have to explicitly say that this is a partial function. Yeah. Okay. So that that was a bit more difficult. Um, so we have basically the again. I'm introducing a bit more of the functional uh, paradigm to you. I introduced how values are applied previously. How values are applied on uh, or functions are applied to values which is the core of, of the functional paradigm, how we don't mutate state. And now I'm telling you about closures, basically where you, where you have new functions that have access to the context of the function that created it, yeah? And you have partial functions that are half done. They are functions created by providing partial arguments to other functions. So you got these new functions, right? And currying, which is not available in, in closure, is basically an automatic version of that. And currying is quite a powerful thing. Closure doesn't have it. It basically means that your code looks simpler, yeah? So now that we have partial functions, by the way, any questions? No? Well, thank you, Sergey, for pointing out that add four and not, add five and not four. All right, so now I'm going to sit, show you a bit of a kind of a partial function in the wild. So we had this FizzBuzz uh, kata that we did, yeah? Now, I could actually say to myself, well, you know, this whole thing around here is like, there's a lot of duplication here. How do I remove this, this duplication? Yeah. And I can apply a, in this case, it won't be a partial function, but you can have a similarly as a partial function, but I'll create a function that will then use, then I can use that function to make this a bit more readable. Yeah. You can use it with partial functions. In this case, I will probably just use it without the partial function, okay? So I can say, I can have like a helper function, a describer function like you have in any other language. Uh, and I can call, I can say that and use the let. So let is basically, again, I was just showing to you a way of creating scoped variables, yeah? So I'm saying let, uh, divisible by 
Yeah. So in fact, let me just like this. And then I'm saying, okay, let's create an anonymous function. Yeah. And that takes the di divider, not the dividend, yeah, the divider. And it says, in this case, it will say it's the same thing that I'm doing here. Yeah. Yeah. So, but instead of, um, instead of the, the 15, the actual value, yeah. I'm gonna say here. So now I've created a a function called divisible by. In fact, I can do this so that you can see it better. Yeah, that is saying that it's an it's an anonymous function, uh, anonymous function that is takes it. So when I say divisible by, it says okay, well, is is the number provided? divisible by that yeah in a way it, it's actually a, a it's not a past function but this is a closure yeah because it's actually referring to this state but this function is already def de defined now i could have defined it outside as well passing in this n and it, it would still remember that state that context it was created using so again the context is closing over that function so now i can say here so I need to remain in this block now and I can bring my condition in here. Yeah. So I can say because I have this divisible by function. Yeah. So rather than having this whole thing. Yeah. I can, in fact, say. So I can say divisible by 15. Is well by 50, I think is right. Yeah. And then in here I can say um yeah, divisible by three. Yeah. And I can say yeah. Divisible by five. Okay. Yeah. So as you can see, it's already got a bit easier to read. Yeah. Because now I can read the actual rules of my my kata, and I'll say, well, actually, what well, it's you know, if it's divisible by fifteen, it's a buzz and so on and so on. It just becomes a bit easier to read, and when you have a lot of code, it helps to have it have it a bit more descriptive, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that, right? So now I can evaluate this whole thing and I can evaluate that again. And if I do run this again, you can see it's equivalent to the previous function, yeah? So it's, this is a an example of a closure as in CL, O S U R E um, that helps you create a, a, a function, a, a closed function, a closure rather, that will then help you describe uh, your rules a bit better. Yeah. So the use of partial functions, the use of closures, all these things, and in fact, the use of macros is something I'll, I may tell you later on in the next exercises help you create domain-specific language within your code, a DSL within your code, right? So Clojure is actually very good at creating DSLs because it has all these things, but it also has macros. Um, most functional languages will have all these things, but most functional languages don't have macros, right? So Clojure is one of the most powerful languages when you start, when you are talking about creating domain-specific languages because you can create functions and code that actually represent the business in a much more natural way and in a much easier way. Yeah. Of course, 
that's debatable. Other languages are also very good at that, but closure is, is quite powerful. So when people talk about, oh, I can't see the brackets, it's difficult to read. Actually, once you start getting used to it, closure programs are often some of the most readable programs that I've seen. So I think that's, we are nearly running out of time, aren't we, Maria? We are. <laughs> All right, so I think we'll, we'll stop there. We've we've kind of gone into, we've done a bit of recap and then we went straight into something, some kind of more advanced topics in the functional paradigm. Closures, partials, cutting, not spotted in, in, in closure, but you should learn about it anyway. So for, for your homework, if you could go, and now learn about, you know, do some reading on what a closure is, do some reading on what partial functions are, what currying is, um, and also do some reading on the previous things that I went over, which is applying functions to values without mutating state, yeah? Then, then you're already well your way into learning the functional paradigm. Okay, any questions? Okay, so there's a question for Sergey. Oh, yes, the question, uh, yes, divisible by, why do I have a question mark under divisible by? So closure actually it has very strong idioms. Uh, what do I mean by idiom? Idioms are certain practices, certain ways of doing things that help, that help standardize programs, see, help them make more readable, yeah? So in closure, uh, the, it's quite idiomatic to put a question mark when you are when you are expecting a boolean return. Similarly, it is idiomatic, as in it's the done thing, to put a uh, an exclamation mark when you are mutating state. If a function mutates certain kind of states or has side effects, you often put the exclamation mark. That is a warning to people that this function will mutate or will have a side effect. Because unlike kind of more imperative languages, it's very few cases where you will have side effects in your functions. So when you have a side effect, you put an exclamation mark. And when you have a um, question mark, it means that it's you should be expecting a Boolean value back. It's not a typed language, so also it's, it's one of the, the other reason that that's um, that's useful. Yeah. Yes, of course it works without the question mark. It's just a naming convention. Any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> Okay, well, if there are no other questions, in the next session, we will go a bit more into mutating state, and we will even do a kata. And in the final one, I will show you how to test drive a kata in, in closure, right? TDD is an advanced thing to do. Uh, so that's why I am leaving it for now, so that the final session, we will do a a uh, uh, programming exercise using test-driven development. But within the REPL, it's very easy to run things. So in, in certain ways, you're always, as you're making changes, you are running it to verify that that is correct. But you know, in some ways it's test-driven, but not really TDD because you know, ideally you, those tests you, you should be able to run over and over again. And you should be running all the tests not the next test that will verify the next behavior. Yeah, cool. So also for your homework, please make sure that you have your ID running for the next one. Yeah, it will help. I'm not gonna go through through the recap again for the how to run an ID or how to have a file that and how to run tests. So that's all. We also be good for the final session for you to 
do have that set up, but I'll show you that in the next session. Cool. That's all from me. Cool. Amazing. So thanks, everybody. David Castro just left us a message. Thank you very much. Really nice and clarifying talk. Thank you, David, for being here. Sergey, too, for your participation. Everybody, just a reminder that this is a recorded session, that we have the previous two sessions on our YouTube channel that I've, I've shared the link in the chat. And I hope to see you in the next one. Helder. Oh, thank you. Thank you for uh, your participation here. Thank you, Marsh. Awesome, as always. <laughs> and I uh, encourage everybody to take a look at the videos that are amazing and uh, follow the, the the rest of the content that are on the channels. Uh, uh, very enrichment discussions uh, also with uh, Jose and Sandro that are uh, every week or every two weeks, something like that. Every so Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> Every Tuesday, but we are taking a bit of a break for our holidays. We always yeah. take a holiday break. <laughs> but probably next week we'll start again. Yeah. Yes, but you can check the 51 previous ones that we have. <laughs> we got a lot. There, there there's a lot, lot of content. You don't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah. And so thank, thank you, you thank everybody. You. Thank you, Hilder. Thank you, Mash. Thank you.